Wow, it's great to have such a vibrant crowd here today. Uh, welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. I'm Mike Voinovich, a member of CMC's Board of Trustees and also the Managing Director of uh, BDO. It's great to see everyone here today. Today's forum marks CMC's first forum of 2019 one that I always look forward to, and by the looks of today's crowd, so do you. It's our annual Blue Chip Economic Forecast, which is sponsored by BDO, Fifth Third, Dispatch Media Group, King Business Interiors, and Columbus Regional Airport Authority. Each are represented here by many friends and associates. Won't you please help me thank them? Now, let's welcome Stephanie Green. She's the Senior Vice President and Managing Director of Fifth Third's Private Bank to introduce our forum. Stephanie. Thank you, Michael. Fifth Third Bank is proud to support the Columbus Metropolitan Club and its mission to engage our community in conversations on important topics. Today we are eager to hear what the future may hold for our financial well-being, both as individuals and as active members of the larger community. You know, Ronald Reagan once said, if trivial pursuit were invented by an economist, it would have 100 questions and 3,000 answers. <laughs> Well, we're lucky enough to have two economists with us today, so we are certain to get all of our questions answered, possibly even those we didn't even ask. So please let me introduce our speakers. Our first, the first economist joining us today is the owner of Reaganomics, Mr. Bill Lafayette. Our second economist, Professor and Anderson Chair of Agricultural Marketing Policy and Trade at The Ohio State University, Mr. Ian Sheldon. And our host, journalist at the Columbus Dispatch, Mr. Mark Williams. Mark. Bill will make opening remarks and then Mark will host the conversation. Bill, stage is yours. Thank you, Stephanie. Well, Happy New Year, everybody, and thank you very much for coming. As always, thanks to CMC for having me back again. I think this is my 18th January here. Um, I'm very happy to welcome back Professor Ian Sheldon. He's going to give us a national economic perspective, particularly related to trade, which is a slightly hot topic these days. Also back as our moderator is Mark Williams of the Dispatch. Uh, this is Mark's eighth year on the stage with me. So let me start off by looking back. We've had a truly phenomenal run the past nine years. Employment started growing after the recession at the beginning of 2010. Since then, the 10-county Columbus Metropolitan Statistical Area has added 186,000 net new jobs, growth of more than 20 percent. The U.S. is up 15.5 percent, and Ohio is up less than 13 percent. For the first time ever, we crossed 1.1 million jobs in the MSA last year. Central Ohio's employment gain each year between 2011 and 2016 was 2.3 percent or better. In 2017, we managed 1.8 percent. But 2018 was not as good. The preliminary totals show us up by 1.4 percent. But I think those are a touch low. I think we'll probably wind up with something closer to 1.5. But for the first time since 2007, our job growth was less than the national average. And for the first time in my memory, we actually matched Ohio's growth. I hate to say this, but I missed this badly last year. My 2018 forecast predicted 1.8%. 
but I think I know where I went wrong. More about that in a moment. The forecast that you have before you is my 20th. I'm predicting that 2019 will be our 10th consecutive year of growth. Like 2018, though, we should do less well than the national average and possibly less well than Ohio. My forecast expects a gain of 1.2 percent, something like 13,000 net new jobs. This is by far my weakest forecast since the recession, but keep in mind that it's stronger growth than any year between 2003 and 2007. So what's going on? I think the fundamental problem facing us is workforce availability. The Columbus MSA labor force was up only 0.5 percent from 2017. Uh, the share of Central Ohio's working age population in the labor force is currently running around 65 percent. When the expansion began, it was 67 percent, and in 2000, it was 70 percent. The working age population is defined as everybody 16 years and older. That group has actually been growing faster than the population of Central Ohio as a whole, between 1.3 percent and 1.7 percent per year since 2013. The problem, though, is that there is no upper bound on the working age population as it's defined, so it counts the elderly, most of whom are retired. But if you look at the population between 16 and 65, its growth's been much slower, something around 1 percent per year. The problem is that you cannot grow employment by 2.5 percent per year and grow the relevant population by 1 percent per year and not expect to run into trouble eventually. There are a couple other reasons for my suspicion that our big problem is workforce. First are the industries in which employment growth has really slowed. Uh, construction, <laughs> transportation, leisure, and administrative support. The weakness in administrative support is almost completely due to the steep decline in temporary employment. And those are the industries that are screaming the loudest for workforce. My second reason for thinking that workforce is the problem is the flow of online help wanted ads. If there were basic economic problems causing the big slowdown in employment growth, we'd see a corresponding slowdown in job postings in central Ohio. But this hasn't happened. Job postings as a share of total employment are down from where they were earlier in the expansion, but they've actually held pretty steady since mid-2016. This workforce problem, though, can't go on for long without having real impacts on corporate efficiency, profitability, and our region's economic growth. And there are signs that this has already started to happen. Also, projections by the state suggest that we're going to have at least another decade of slow growth of the 16 to 65 population. So what can we do about this? There are several possibilities. First and probably most important, we have to keep prioritizing educational attainment through the Columbus Compact and other initiatives. We pride ourselves that our share of college degree holders is greater than the national average. That's true, but we are significantly lower than metros such as Austin, Boston, Denver, Minneapolis, and Seattle. We also need to emphasize technical programs. People with a high school diploma and a technical credential are far better off than those with a high school diploma and no technical credential. This effort to prioritize educational attainment includes doing everything that we possibly can to make these programs accessible and affordable to a very broad audience. 
we need to focus on attracting people of working age to our region. This includes migrants from other countries. For example, I did a study several months ago on the contribution of the Hispanic population to the central Ohio economy and to workforce growth. That contribution is significant. Finally, we need to engage other diverse populations in our workforce. The county is sponsoring a program called Building Futures that works with people with minimal skills to prepare them for careers in construction and in other trades. Another important group is the senior population, which is growing by leaps and bounds. Many of these folks are retiring, but many may want or need to keep working. This population has tremendous skills, wisdom, and experience to offer, but it turns out that ageism is alive and well. Just this morning, CBS reported on an Urban Institute study that found that 56% of workers older than 50 are laid off at least once, and 90% of those laid off never recover the earnings that they lost. I'm actually board president of an organization called Employment for Seniors, which links individuals 50 and older to job opportunities throughout our region. Before I close, though, I invite us all to take a deep breath. This forecast, admittedly, is not nearly as good as it has been, but I'm still predicting a rate of growth that's going to keep everybody working. And as I said earlier, we wished in vain for 1.2% growth during the last expansion. So thanks again for coming, and I wish you all success, health, and happiness in 2019. Mark, it's your turn. Do you all need to know that I'm me? Yes. Uh, Happy New Year. Um, it's good to see you all again. It's good to be back. And, um, uh, hosting this conversation again, and uh, thanks to Bill and the CMC for allowing me to participate. Um, I'm really happy to see Ian back with us today. Uh, for those of you who remember, he was with us two years ago, um, right before the Trump administration took office, so we'll have some uh, interesting things to talk about with that. Um, the three of us were at the dispatch on Friday getting ready for today, and I got to tell you, the conversation got pretty geeky. <laughs> um, we started talking about things like uh, Brexit, tariffs, the economy, productivity, the dollar, trade deficit, and of course the big jobs report last Friday. Um, I have to say that um, having the three of us back together seems sort of like a sequel to Revenge of the Nerds. <laughs> Um, Ohio's economy hit a notable achievement last year. As Bill was talking about, some of the job growth um, in the state has been better. Um, we, we now have had a record for total employment of 5.6 million jobs. Um, that broke the old record that was set in the year 2000. Um, as, but before we get all excited, though, we need to think about this for a minute. Almost 20 years, 20 years to break that old mark. I doubt that anyone in, in, this, in this room that runs a business would be, uh, would be happy with that kind of record. Um, before I came to the dispatch, I worked at the Associated Press, and I had not been there long, and I was editing a, court, a quarterly financial story um, about Procter & Gamble, one of our great Ohio companies. Um, and early stories at the AP were very straightforward. The lead is, uh, the lead is basically what happened and why. Um, so in this case, way down in the story, the reporter who wrote it noted about seven paragraphs down that the earnings for that period were a record. And I, and I called him and I said, shouldn't that be the lead? That sounds to me like that's really significant, a, a record for this great company. And he responded that that's not what we do. Our style is typically to do it with the very straightforward way we'd always done it. Um, but he said I could change it if I wanted to. Um, so I did, and I sent the story off to our business desk in New York. And within minutes, I have an editor screaming at me, saying, companies should always report records. And um, so anyway, it, it just sort of, it stuck with me after all these years. And um, so 
that's sort of the way I look at the state jobs number. It's better, but we should always be getting better. And if we're not getting better, um, then something's wrong. Um, so by most accounts, our economy is healthy and doing well. Um, we know that uh, our employment rate is low in Ohio and low nationwide. Uh, but yet the economic um, prosperity hasn't been shared equally around the country. Um, last month, another reporter, Mark Ferencheck, and I wrote about the struggles of our medium and small sized cities in Ohio that have not only not recovered from the Great Recession, but the one before that in 2000. We used the line that splits Delaware and Marion counties as the peg for the story. On one side, we have one of the most prosperous counties in America. On, on the other, a county that has struggled for decades with plant closings, a stagnant population, poverty, and more recently, an opioid problem. While we use Marion County as our example, Ohio is littered with counties experiencing the same problems. Here's your fact for the day. Since the end of the recession, the top 20% of the nation's metro areas have created as many jobs as the bottom 80%. We're fortunate that we live in one of the cities that's doing well. The downside of that is I don't believe that we as a group here don't understand what is happening elsewhere in, in, in Ohio, in cities like Bill's hometown of Springfield or my hometown of Dayton, or just ask the people in Lordstown now dealing with a, a, a GM plant that's ready to close. Um, I spoke with the mayor of Lima for the stories that Mark and I did, and I think he said it best. The decision makers in Franklin County and Central Ohio are seeing the growth we aren't experiencing in the rest of the state. They aren't seeing what the rest of us are seeing and experiencing, and that's the problem. The good news for many of these cities is they recognize that they need to do more to revitalize their, their hometowns. Um, but it is an issue that is going to require more attention. These cities play an important role in, in the overall well-being of our state's economic health, and they represent about a third of all Ohioans. If these cities don't, well, don't do well, it's hard to see the state doing well. So uh, I'm going to get Ian in the ball game here. So Ian, when we were here two years ago, President Trump was getting ready to take office, and we talked a lot about that day, about uh, trade and the economy and what might happen. Um, since then, we've put tariffs on steel, aluminum, washing machines, all kinds of goods from China. And the president makes regular threats to increase them or add to the list with such things as European autos. Of course, our trading partners have retaliated with uh, tariffs of their own on our goods, on Harley motorcycles, liquor, and most notably for us here in Ohio, maybe Ohio ag products. Kind of give us an update on where we're at and um, how all this is playing out. Back again, Mark and, and Bill, and we've already heard two jokes about economists, so um, I guess I'll just make a joke about myself, and that is uh, I've been a trade economist for 35 years, and probably for the, the majority of those 35 years, I, I lived in my little ivory tower, either down here on campus or at my previous institution back in the UK. And I never thought trade policy would ever become that interesting to the, to the person in the street. And last year, I did a count. I did 77 media interviews and nine podcasts. And wow, I suddenly feel relevant after 35 <laughs> years. So on that note, um, let me just give you a summary of where we are on trade. And, and so first of all, uh, when the president, the first thing the president did after inauguration was actually to pull out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, this was a pretty significant trade deal that would have accounted for about 25% of global GDP, and the US would have done really well in exporting services, uh, agricultural commodities, particularly to Japan, and also high-tech products. And pulling out of that means that we've lost that potential for growing uh, market share and, and GDP growth. And also, I think the Trans-Pacific Partnership would have put in place um, some disciplines on intellectual property, state-owned enterprises, et cetera, uh, in the Asia-Pacific region that eventually China would have probably joined the Trans-Pacific Partnership and would have been subject uh, to those disciplines about which we're now fighting uh, uh, with China. Uh, secondly, um, I, I see Adams here in the audience. Uh, we ran around the state uh, talking to uh, newspaper editors saying, hey, if we don't uh, renegotiate NAFTA in a way that's positive for agriculture, this is going to be really bad, not just for the Ohio ag sector, 
uh, but for the ag sector in general, as, as well as other industries uh, in North America. Uh, fortunately, NAFTA was renegotiated. Um, the Economist actually called it NUFTA. Uh, uh, and what's the old Ho Who song? Old, old boss, same as the new boss. Uh, the agreements, the new agreement, the, the USMCA, is not that much different from NAFTA. The biggest change is uh, in the rules on uh, North American content for the automobile industry. So let me move into talking a little bit about where we are. Um, the aluminum and steel tariffs were the, the first really big uh, thing that the administration did uh, on the grounds of national security. We can debate whether that's a legitimate reason for imposing those tariffs. What you need to know is that, for one, Canada is actually our most important supplier of both steel and aluminum. China is a very modest supplier, so these tariffs are largely affecting our allies, both here in North America and, and in Europe. Um, and essentially what that's done is push up uh, input prices for firms in the US that use steel and has also driven down the world steel price and is actually hurting quite a lot of small developing country exporters of steel because we already have global excess capacity in the steel industry. We then had a series of the US put in place tariffs on $50 billion worth of Chinese imports. China retaliated with tariffs against our three most important export industries to China, soybeans, uh, automobiles and automobile parts, and the aircraft sector. Um, the US then put in place this big tranche of tariffs, uh, first of all against, uh, against $200 billion worth of imports. And the most important thing about that second round of tariffs was it was moving away from goods that are what we call intermediate goods or inputs into the manufacturing sector, more into the consumer goods sector. And that's starting to bite, I think. Uh, there was an article in the New York Times last Sunday describing a furniture manufacturer uh, here in the US that supplies furniture to American hotel chains. Um, for example, he makes doors. The company makes doors. Uh, he couldn't get the handles for the doors because mm. they were imported from China, and he was having to outsource or offshore uh, supplies uh, to another country. So I think right now it hasn't really hurt consumers that much, but if the negotiations with China that, are, as you know, this morning, uh, they just finished the first round of three days of talks in Beijing. I, I can't tell you what they've agreed on because they haven't actually had a, a press uh, release yet. Uh, but if that is not successful, uh, I, um, I think the US will then put in place, will raise these tariffs from 10% to 25% and potentially will, will implement what the president threatened a few months ago to implement 25% tariffs on another $267 billion worth of Chinese imports, which would pretty much account for all of our imports from China. And those would cover about 5,000 product lines that would directly affect American consumers. So what about the costs? Uh, you already mentioned Harley-Davidson has outsourced production to the EU. Why? Because the EU retaliated with a tariff against Harley-Davidson motorcycles. So the company simply is outsourcing production, I believe, to Asia. Um, lost market share for the US soybean sector. Um, just to give you a number, we'll talk about agriculture in a minute, but we've seen a 94% reduction in soybean exports to China compared to last year. We run the risk of losing hard-won market share for that sector. If we put up 25% tariffs against automobiles and automobile parts, uh, the latest numbers I've seen is about 165,000 jobs will be lost in the automobile sector. And if the Europeans and the Japanese retaliate, we're talking about nearly half a million jobs potentially lost in that industry. The World Bank this morning forecasts that global economic growth is going to slow down, partly because of Brexit, partly because of the trade war with China, and also because uh, emerging economies like China are slowing down anyways. These tariff increases are actually relatively modest. Uh, our average tariffs in the US were about 1 to 3 percent prior to the administration raising tariffs. They're up to about, on average, 1.8 to 3 percent. And just for the record, the average Chinese tariff is about 8 to 9 percent. So the Chinese tariffs aren't as high as you're being led to believe in some of the more extreme stories in the media. My last point before we, we move on to the next question is there has been no improvement in the U.S. trade deficit. 
it's actually got worse. Uh, and the last number I've, I've picked up on from the Department of Commerce is as of October for 2018, the trade deficit is running at $503 billion. Uh, so it looks like it's gonna round out the year at about close to 600 billion, which is an increase. We will not improve the US trade deficit with trade policy. The only way we're gonna lower the US trade deficit is through macroeconomic policy. And we can talk about that later. So, uh, Ian, we know that the Chinese don't play fair when it comes to trade. And, you know, but, there, but are there better ways to take them on, um, especially when we're dealing with issues like intellectual property, than this tactic that the Trump administration is, is using now? Yeah, I mean, China, when it, was, when it acceded to the WTO in, in the early part of the, of the, the, the 2000s, uh, 2001 is when they were allowed to come into the WTO, they signed a unique treaty uh, with the, uh, the other members of the WTO, and that was that they would uh, abide by the Intellectual Property Rights Agreement. It's called TRIPS, that's the, the acronym. By the way, trade economists have to hold a lot of acronyms in their, in their head at any given moment of time. Um, TRIPS is an agreement that's supposed to allow, you know, you're supposed to expect protection and uh, property rights will be enforced in the country where you either license technology or you transfer a technology to. And secondly, China agreed not to force technology transfer um, when they joined the WTO. So my view is that uh, the US should not be approaching this bilaterally, it should be, be approaching it uh, multilaterally. For the record, uh, the Obama administration from 2008 to 2016 when uh, Obama left office spent eight years trying to negotiate a bilateral investment treaty with China which would have, would have approached the issue of the transfer of international, uh, sorry, of intellectual property. Uh, the current administration chose not to continue that negotiation. And what I'm getting at here is these are nuanced, complex issues that take time to negotiate. And the thing that concerns me is that we should be doing this in combination with the EU, the European Union, and Japan, who are the other two big players in the transfer of intellectual property. And the problem with the US going on its own is that the EU and Japan will free ride of whatever benefits we're able to achieve in any negotiation that we get uh, with China. Plus, uh, the ability to enforce these agreements are very much a function of using the dispute, uh, trade dispute settlement mechanism in the WTO. So I would freely admit to being a multilateralist and we should be doing this multilaterally in combination with our, with our key allies, uh, the EU and Japan, and slapping uh, aluminum and steel import tariffs on our, our trading partners uh, in that manner I don't think helps our cause in dealing with China. So we're gonna take questions here in a couple minutes. Um, so uh, the microphone will be set up over there. Uh, don't be shy. Um, but I wanna get into one final issue before we do that. Um, our current economic expansion is about as long as, uh, is goes about as long as we, the, the longest one we've ever had. Um, but we're getting some hints that the steam is starting to run out just a bit. Uh, Federal Reserve has been raising interest rates. Stock market's been a little bit grouchy. Um, that's a good way of saying it, I know. Uh, the effects of the corporate tax cut may be wearing off, uh, fiscal stimulus, that kind of thing. Yet the jobs report on Friday was really strong. Um, are we good for this year, or uh, is there a recession heading our way? Unequivocally, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, the economics community thinks that growth's going to hold this year. Uh, the latest survey from the uh, uh, Philadelphia Fed is that uh, that we probably will not see a down GDP quarter this year. Uh, on the other hand, there was a Wall Street Journal article last month that said that half of the CFOs in a survey of them predict a recession by the end of this year. 80% uh, say that we'll have one by the end of next year. Of course, CFOs are a cautious, conservative bunch, so you can take that for what it's worth. Um, obviously, we've got some potential problems that could get serious. Uh, tariffs and trade disputes, uh, corporate earnings. Uh, there have been recent news stories that companies are starting to trim their, their growth forecasts. 
and then the pace of the increases that the Fed is uh, doing on interest rates. That could cause an inverted yield curve, which has always been a uh, forerunner of a recession, but may or may not be this time. Um, on the other hand, a recession can come on very quickly. The clouds can darken very quickly. That's what happened in 2007. Uh, so uh, I guess we'll have to wait and see. Ian? Ian? Well, I'm just going to plug the number that came out of the American Economic Association meetings last week in uh, Atlanta. 40% uh, of the profession are forecasting a recession in 2020. So mm -hmm. I, I think that's getting close to a 50-50 bet. Um, mm -hmm. Just to back up something Bill said, uh, and this is something that um, the baby feds keep uh, an eye on, it's the yield curve. So the, the yield curve is the relationship between short-term securities and long-term securities. So in, in normal times, uh, one-year securities have, uh, have low yields, and then as you go out to 10, 20 uh, longer yield security, uh, sorry, uh, longer time securities, the yield should get higher. The yield curve is flattened out. If you compare, I think it's one or two-year securities with 10-year securities, and uh, there's a real concern that it's about to invert. And just for the record, an inverted yield curve has forecast the last seven recessions. So I would, <clears throat> I would keep a, a look on that statistic. The only thing that I would say that's a little bit interesting about this time is central banks around the world were working virtually with zero interest rates. And the Federal Reserve, uh, the European Central Bank, the Bank of England, are gradually raising short-term rates in order to give themselves some ammunition to fight the next recession. But at the same time, uh, major central banks, notably the Fed and the European Central Bank, did this thing called quantitative easing during the recession, which was where they bought up a lot of long-term securities, which did what? It pushed up the price of bonds, but it pushed down the yields. And that's partly why the yield curve is, is, is relatively flat right now. So, Right now, the experts in this area are saying if the yield curve inverts, we're going to get a recession, and typically it's about six to 20 months out from that yield curve inversion. So, so that's a bit go. nerdy and geeky, but that, there you go. Yeah. See, these are the kinds of things that we talk about. Um, of course, it is CMC's tradition to take questions from the audience. Uh, please state your name and ask your question. In fairness to all, please avoid editorial comments and uh, questions end with a question mark. So let's get started. First question, please. Yes, good, good afternoon. I'm Mark Barbax with the Ohio Economic Development Association, and I want to follow the rule of my uh, labor economist father who says, if an economist asks you to ask another question, ask him it. So I want to ask Ian to follow on to his comment about what could be done to reduce the trade deficit. Okay. Um, well, it's not trade policy. Um, so I hate to do a macroeconomics 101 talk in two minutes, but I'll do my best. Essentially, it's well understood uh, that the, the trade deficit, this is the difference between the amount of goods and services that we import and what we export is largely driven by the fact that the US um, has relatively low rates of, of national savings compared to uh, the demand for investment. And that's driven by the fact that we, that aggregate demand, that's overall demand in the US economy is greater than aggregate supply. And so really the only place for that demand to go is, is into imports. And at a time when we're running the economy at full employment, with the Fed raising rates, it, it's really hard to battle into that wind. So there are a lot of, um, yeah, you said for every economist, you're going to get a different uh, suggestion as to how to solve this problem. I, I forget which president it said, give me a one-handed economist, because each economist says on the one hand and then on, on the other. So I got one hand up behind my back. The policy solutions um, are not very palatable. One is to reduce government spending and to raise taxes because there's a clear connection between the budget deficit, the fiscal deficit, and the trade deficit. So we're now running a budget deficit of what, a trillion dollars? And people like um, Jeffrey Frankel, who's a, a better macroeconomist than I am at, at Harvard, talks about the twin peaks. So when you're running a very large budget deficit, you tend to put pressure on the trade deficit. 
So dealing with government spending, uh, getting consumers to save more, these are the obvious policy solutions. Now all the time foreigners are willing to underwrite our willingness to import, in other words, foreigners hold, uh, have um, rights over securities, be they private securities or government treasuries, all the time they're willing to lend to us, that's great. And, that, and that's always been the case pretty much since we came off the Bretton Woods Agreement in 1971, is that the dollar is the vehicle currency of the world and foreigners are willing to invest in, in American securities. I mean, economists talk about risk-free risk -free assets. U.S. Treasuries are about the closest you'll get to a risk-free asset. So all the time they're willing to lend to us, all thing, things are peachy. We can run a trade deficit. But there's always a risk that people start selling those securities. And the Chinese have that nuclear option, I might point out. They hold a lot of our securities and they could dump them in a hurry. That would lead to a significant depreciation in the US dollar, which would lead to a, a recession and to inflation. So the other policy solution is to have a managed depreciation of the dollar in combination with a steady reduction in the budget deficit as a way of bringing us back into some kind of equilibrium. So that's, a, that's macroeconomics in probably more than two minutes, but <laughs> that's my answer to the question. Next question, please. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> It's Tom Borgerding, retired from WOSU Radio. Um, this question to Professor Sh Sheldon and also uh, to um, economist uh, Lafayette. It's a question that's been asked of me and I don't know how to answer it. So I'm gonna ask you, what long-term effect, if any, will tariffs have on employment among manufacturers and retailers? Specifically, will it, eventually create more jobs as promised in places like Mansfield, Middletown, or Lancaster, or Springfield. Will these tariffs eventually create job opportunities in these small and medium-sized cities in Ohio? I don't think so. Um, and here's why. Uh, if you're going to put a tariff on imported steel, uh, that obviously helps uh, steel manufacturing employment in uh, the U.S. and here in Ohio. The problem is that there are many, many more companies and many, many more employees who work for firms that uh, fabricate steel as opposed to make steel. Those companies get hurt by these tariffs, and so it is uh, a net negative. I would agree with Bill, and I think one of the things that's changed in my lifetime as an economist is the growing importance of value chains. Mm -hmm. And that's something that's, that needs to be taken into account when we think about implementing tariffs, say, in the automobile sector. So let's take a Ford built down in Mexico about, well, there's debate about exactly how much value added is produced here in the US, but uh, let's take the upper bound number just to make my argument stronger. Um, use and abuse of statistics. The administration claims 17% of, of Ford built in Mexico is, is sourced originally from the US. Economists who've spent time actually calculating these things say it's more like 27 to 30%. So these are intermediate inputs that are designed and built here in the US, go across the border, they often come back again for retesting and then they go back again. If you implement broad tariffs against uh, Mexican-produced automobiles, all you're doing is undermining value-added production and jobs here in, in the U.S. And the same is true of, say, let's take the agricultural sector, for example. Here in North America, we now have a highly integrated pork production system where young hogs are raised up in Canada. They're sent down to the U.S. to be fed out in states like Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Iowa, etc. here in the Midwest and then they get slaughtered and processed here in the US and then the pork gets exported to Mexico uh, which is our number one processed pork market or to China which is our second most important processed pork market. When we initiated our aluminum tariffs, guess what the first two tariffs were, steel and aluminum tariffs, guess which products the Mexicans and the Chinese immediately slapped 40% and 25% tariffs on. 
imports of processed pork, which automatically undermines the competitiveness of, of that pork production chain. And the same is true of, of manufacturing these value chains. The North American automobile sector competes globally. If you change the rules of origin, if you implement tariffs, you make it harder for these multinational corporations to, to compete internationally. And um, the, some of the foreign companies are already talking about not abiding by the, NAF, the new NAFTA rules of origin content rules, but simply building cars in Mexico and exporting to the, to the US and paying the 2.5% tariff at the border. These value chains are very sensitive to interruptions through trade barriers. I won't talk about Brexit because my head always explodes when I talk about Brexit. <laughs> Next question, please. Gentlemen, I'm Jim Shimmer. I'm Franklin County's Development Director. And the one thing I see missing um, in this discussion is the fact that last week I drove by a gas station and it was $1.66 a gallon. So uh, the question that I have for you is, how does that relate to uh, something that I'm passionate about, which is alternative uh, energy? Uh, and what do you see for energy consumption going forward uh, as we go into this new year? You can take that one. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, low gas prices, low oil prices um, allow uh, households to spend their money on other things. And so that's, that's certainly helpful from that standpoint. Uh, it does, though, increase the, um, the uh, attraction of fossil fuels relative to alternative energy, which in the long run is not a good thing. The thing, though, that we have to re remember about um, say solar energy, ver um, uh, wind energy versus fossil fuels is that uh, fossil fuel prices go like this over time and uh, uh, solar and wind and other alternative energies are much more uh, steady in their price. And so it ought to be that people would be willing to pay a premium for alternative energies simply to uh, uh, stabilize their uh, uh, costs. You would certainly think that would be. I, I really haven't heard that argument made by much. I think it ought to be made a whole lot more than it is. Yeah, so one of the things that has happened in the past year is that the U.S. now is the number one oil producer in the world. And we are now exporting a lot of oil and a lot of refined products. We are just about energy independent. Um, and so it's going to be interesting to see how this happens. Uh, of course, we're also at the seasonal bottom on gasoline. Mm -hmm. um, enjoy yeah. it now while you can. Mm -hmm. uh, next question. Yes. Um, uh uh, this is a wonderful uh, forum. Um, I haven't heard anybody talk about uh, real estate. Since real estate dramatically affects the cost of living, and, and Columbus is really lucky to, so far to have a very low cost of living as far as real estate compared to other cities of its size and larger, um, and I, I, I saw prices of rents and housing costs rise significantly in the last couple of years, at, at, at um, what do you think on a national level and a local level, how do you think that's going to affect, uh, be affected? Or well, how do you, is it going to go up or down or what, what's going to happen? No, You're, if, if, if I knew that answer, Warren, I don't think I'd be sitting here. I'd be on a beach somewhere, but <laughs> I, I can certainly hazard a guess. Um, our population continues to increase by leaps and bounds. For those of you who were here the other week for the forum on housing, um, we aren't producing nearly enough housing to meet the demand. And so uh, the price of housing, the price of rent has gone up, will continue to go up um, unless something truly drastic happens. Um, and so uh, that is a big concern of mine from a standpoint of affordability. Uh, when you start talking about $800, $900 a month, 
being an affordable monthly rent when you talk about 45% of uh, Central Ohio renters who are paying more than 30% of their income just on rent and are and therefore meet the definition of being uh, uh, housing cost burdened, um, I certainly see that problem getting a lot worse. Yeah, so the interest rates have come up a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, it's become, I mean, it's been a seller's market for years. We're now seeing a little bit of a slide on that. Um, inventory for sale has gone up a little bit um, versus what it's been like. But it is going to be interesting. The affordability issue is something I think is going to be, uh, is going to be uh, something that is going to be a serious issue to address. Um, I think we have time for one more quick one, or Andy's kind of. Sure. Hi, uh, Andy Campbell. Um, we've heard an awful lot uh, over the past years about automation and artificial intelligence, and I'm wondering if you're beginning to see anything uh, reflected in the jobs or the employment market in regards to these new technologies and replacing jobs. I, I can answer this one, guys. Yeah, answer it. Um, so I did a story last year with, uh, with one of our editors um, on this whole issue, and it's stunning. The amount, the number of jobs that could be automated is somewhere like around half of all the jobs that are out there. So you think of the logical ones, and you know, um, anyone who drives anything, um, you know, restaurant jobs, um, food service jobs, a lot of that stuff can, uh, you know, even, even more complex things that you think can't be automated, um, lawyer functions, accounting functions that are kind of simple, can a lot of that be automated too? So it's gonna be really interesting to see what happens. Uh, yeah, I hear some of the groaning down here. Uh -huh. So, so the good, I think the, I think the thing about it is, is it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen like, like that. It's going to happen over, uh, over a course of time. And so, um, I think that gives you some time to to adapt to it. Um, but it's certainly going to be, uh, it's going to be something that's quite an issue. And the governor, uh, our soon-to-be ex-governor, has talked about this a lot as well as with, um, with all kinds of things, especially now that we're talking about um, self-driving vehicles and all that kind of thing. So it's gonna be an interesting few years. I think it's something that we're going to have to keep a very, very close eye on. Um, I, I said maybe a little bit hyperbolically at this forum that Mark and I were at last uh, summer that if we don't play our cards right, in 20 or 30 years, we could be Youngstown. We probably won't be, but we have to keep a really close eye on how artificial intelligence and automation is affecting the kinds of white collar clerical jobs that are so common in the central Ohio economy. Okay, I think we're turning things back over to Mike. Well, thank you, uh, Bill, Mark, and Ian. I, I hope all of you found today's forum I hope all of you found today's forum uh, interesting. Certainly a lot of complexities here. Certainly a lot of work for all of us in the Columbus community. Uh, certainly the, the Columbus way gets touted a lot and uh, I'm confident that uh, folks in this room and, and even outside of this room are, are, the, are those that are gonna make the, the difference. Um, we'd like to thank our sponsors again today, BDO, Fifth Third, Dispatch Media Group, King Business Interiors, and the Columbus Regional Airport Authority. And certainly again, our speakers, Mark Williams, Ian Sheldon, and Bill Lafayette. And thanks to all of you for being here. We'll see you next week.